AP Biology, Chapter 45, The Endocrine System. Endocrine glands are glands that produce hormones that are released directly into the bloodstream via ducts, and these hormones, even in small quantities, have a fairly large effect on the body. Hormones are used to regulate the internal conditions of the body, and uh, they have specific effects, even in small quantities. Most importantly, they're involved with homeostasis, or regulating the internal environment, maintaining a steady state condition. Animals have fine-tuned, complex, multifunctioning systems that are interconnected, and communication between these uh, different places in the body is important. We need to regulate things like our metabolic rate, or how fast we break down um, things like glucose and make uh, different things like muscle tissue. We need to regulate how fast we grow, and that's going to be the job of some growth hormones. Maturation, when we mature, and reproduction. So this is something we should write down. The animals rely on two systems for regulation. We have the endocrine system as well as the nervous system. And the thing that you need to know is which one's fast, which one's slow, which one's longer acting, which one's slower acting. The endocrine system are ductless glands, which means that they secrete their products right into the uh, bloodstream. And we should write that down. Endocrine system, ductless glands, secrete chemicals directly in the blood. So you might be asking yourself, well, what is a ducted gland? An example would be your salivary glands or the liver. So if you think about what the salivary glands do, they produce something called salivary amylase, which is an enzyme that breaks down um, starch, and it travels via a duct or a tube directly into your mouth. So if you can imagine that, we have the salivary glands in your jaw, they secrete enzymes right into a tube, into a duct, and then those enzymes go into your mouth. At no point do you have that enter the bloodstream. Because the salivary glands are a ducted gland, we call that an exocrine gland, or E-X-O-crine gland. Endocrine glands are ductless. They release stuff right into the blood. As we're going to talk about later, the pancreas has both endocrine and exocrine function. The endocrine function is to secrete uh, the hormones insulin and glucagon directly into the bloodstream, but it also has a ducted gland, or exocrine gland function, in that it can release enzymes, digestive enzymes directly into the small intestine without going through the blood uh, at all. These are chemical signals that travel to the target tissue via the blood, and they, are, they have a long-lasting response, but it takes longer because you have to deliver it via the blood. So endocrine system, ductless glands, secretes directly into the blood, it takes a longer time for the response to take place, however, it lasts longer. The nervous system consists of neurons, uh, the cells that conduct uh, electrical signals from one part of the body to the other. And as you can imagine, using a uh, biochemical uh, electrical signal is going to be much faster than using chemical signals alone. These transmit the electrical signals to a target tissue. It's a faster response, but it doesn't last as long. And these are the two ways that we uh, communicate with our body. We're going to focus on the endocrine gland mainly. All right, so here's some different examples of how the, um, these pathways work. And we're just going to give you this as an example. You don't have to write this down. Here we have uh, the stimulus of low blood sugar. So your blood sugars are dropping, possibly as a result of exercise. And as a result, we have proteins uh, that are on the outside of your pancreatic cells that will detect chemical signals that will tell that uh, pancreas to release something called glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone. And... We're going to make that through the signal transduction pathway, basically going using DNA, doing transcription and translation. And um, once we release that glucagon, it's going to be released directly into the bloodstream. In the bloodstream, it will travel until it eventually gets to the target cells, which will be uh, found on the liver. And they have special protein binding sites for the uh, glucagon. That's going to trigger another set of chemical reactions that will eventually result in uh, DNA being transcribed and translated to make different proteins that will make enzymes to break down glycogen to release glucose into the blood. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why, why do that? Well, if we have low blood sugar, after we do all these steps, then the glycogen breaks down, glucose is released, blood sugar goes back, and we have a little negative feedback. We've restored our blood sugar. And this is a fairly simple uh, pathway for how this stuff works. So step one, low blood sugar, cause the release of glucagon, from the pancreatic cells. Pancreatic cells dump it right into the bloodstream. It is an endocrine gland. And then the target cells on the liver detect the glucagon, kind of a lock and key model. 
results in DNA being transcribed and translated for proteins that break down glycogen into glucose, raising blood sugar. Now, a second example gets a little more complicated, but it's still fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, here we have suckling. We have a baby that's uh, getting some milk from mom, and that's going to result in a sensory neuron, part of the nervous system, connected to the brain, the hypothalamus in the brain, uh, recognizing the suckling event. Then the hypothalamus is going to release something called oxytocin, and this oxytocin uh, is part of the the endocrine system. It's going to release some uh, hormones. It's going to dump it into the bloodstream. The bloodstream takes the oxytocin to the target cells, which are the smooth muscle in the breast, and the smooth muscle uh, relaxes, allowing milk to be released. And that's how suckling results in milk being released from the breast for a child that's trying to get a meal. And then here we have the more uh, complicated pathway. We have a um, neuron detecting when a woman is pregnant, and uh, that's going to be connected to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is going to release a hormone called prolactin-releasing hormone, that travels via the bloodstream to another gland called the anterior pituitary, also called the master gland, that's going to release a, another hormone called prolactin. And then this prolactin targets the mammary glands, which results in more milk being produced. So here we have two hormones uh, being used, one hormone to trigger another hormone. And we'll have some examples of that coming up as well. This is just like an overview of some of the ways that chemical signals are used in the body. All right, homeostasis, uh, we've talked about this before. Negative feedback is the most common type. Uh, body temperature and sugar metabolism are both examples of negative feedback or reversing a trend. Uh, lactation, you should write this one down, is a good example of positive feedback. Once that child starts suckling, then that releases more milk, which releases more oxytocin uh, in the brain, which re releases more milk, and so forth and so on. Here we have a simple example of uh, negative feedback maintaining uh, stable internal body temperature or thermal homeostasis. We have the blood temperature, um, let's say, going up. It's getting too hot. The skin releases sweat. Sweat evaporates. Blood vessels dilate to increase surface area to release more heat. Then we release that heat from evaporative, evaporative cooling and increased surface area of the blood vessels. The temperature inc decreases, and the brain detects that we're back to normal. Or let's say we get too cold and then we want to conserve some heat. Blood vessels constrict in our extremities, not in our core areas, kind of preserving the, the internal body temperature of the core areas. And we also start to shiver as well. When we shiver, we break down more glucose. That releases heat as a byproduct that increases our body temperature. And again, we maintain that steady state by negative feedback. And in the first case, we had to uh, decrease body temperature, which reversed a trend of increasing body temperature. That's negative feedback. In the second example here, we had body temperature going down and reversing the trend by increasing that body temperature. Remember, negative feedback is reversing a trend. So these are some examples of the endocrine system gland, or ductless glands that release their hormones directly into the bloodstream. Uh, down here, we have some ducted glands, exocrine glands, like the tear glands. Uh, or salivary glands. Hypothalamus, pineal gland, pituitary gland. Uh, we're not going to talk much about the pineal gland, but hypothalamus and pituitary work together in the brain uh, side by side. The thyroid and parathyroids, we're going to talk about those. The thymus gland, you might have heard of T cells, that's where they mature. Adrenal glands, adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys, produce adrenaline. Pancreas, release insulin and glucagon that are involved with sugar homeostasis. Ovaries and testes are involved with the, the uh, sex hormones. All right, so this is a complete list of um, the different hormones as well as what they do, as well as their chemical class. You don't have to know the chemical class at all. We're going to be talking about what they do and, uh, and what these names of these hormones are. Some are more important than the others, uh, and some are regulated by different glands that we're going to talk about uh, coming up. As you can tell, the anterior pituitary gland is going to have a lot of different hormones that it's going to produce. Thyroid gland, parathyroids, not so much. Here are some other um, glands, endocrine glands, and uh, the hormones they produce. All right, these are the first two glands that you have to know about. The hypothalamus, and we do need to write this down, is the master control center, and that's what it's referred to as. It's part of the nervous system. It's kind of like the link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. It's the uh, exchange between those two uh, systems. 
um, can receives information from the nerves, like whether it's too hot or too cold, or if you remember when you get thirsty, that's detected by the hypothalamus. We learned about that in chapter 44. Then it also regulates the release of hormones from the pituitary. So it's kind of like a, um, a way station for information from the nerves and then tells the hormonal uh, system or the endocrine system what to do about it. The pituitary gland is really close to the hypothalamus and really receives information directly from the hypothalamus. This is also called the master gland, and you do need to know that. It's part of the endocrine system only. The hypothalamus was part of the nervous system, and this is going to secrete a broad range of hormones regulating other glands. This is done by the pituitary gland. All right. The um, hypothalamus and pituitary glands, let's take a look at that. Here we have the hypothalamus, and then we see here some connections uh, using neurons. This is a neuron uh, that is connected from the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary. So they're directly linked, not by chemical signals, but by uh, the nervous system. Then the posterior pituitary here is going to release two hormones. One of these hormones you've heard of before, ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. And if you remember, that makes the... Uh, collecting ducts of the kidney more leaky or permeable to water, so you reabsorb more water into the body. So the target for ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, produced by the posterior pituitary is the kidney tubules, or the collecting ducts, to conserve water. And that's the first hormone that you have to know here. The oxytocin produced by the posterior pituitary has a different effect. This is going to target the mammary glands and also the uterine muscles. Uh, the oxytocin is going to stimulate the mammary glands to release milk when the baby is suckling. And these are the two hormones produced by the posterior pituitary in the brain. All right, we're just going to go over uh, ADH here, but if you remember, we have uh, high osmolarity or there is a a lot of hypertonic solutions in the blood as a result of possibly uh, water loss or eating a lot of salty foods. Uh, then the hypothalamus detects that as part of your nervous system, sends a signal down to your posterior pituitary to release ADH or antidiuretic hormone. This is in the kidney here, and the kidney becomes more permeable to water, the collecting duct, so we reabsorb more water into the bloodstream, and that conserves our water, makes our pee a little more yellow, and homeostasis is uh, maintained. Also, it's going to stimulate to drink more water as well. All right, the anterior pituitary gland has a lot more hormones that are being produced than the posterior pituitary, and you are responsible for knowing on many of these. The first two I want to talk about are FSH and LH, and we're going to talk more about those when we talk about the reproductive system. FSH stands for follicle-stimulating hormone, follicle is where the egg comes from, and luteinizing hormone also is going to be involved with egg production. This is going to be involved in the ovaries, but these same two hormones are also involved in the testes for uh, sperm production as well. So these are both sex hormones, or hormones that will trigger the production of other sex hormones and some of the development that goes on in the testes and ovaries. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. As you might be able to guess, it stimulates the thyroid, and we're going to talk more about that later. ACTH will be involved with the stress response, especially with uh, things like adrenaline. We have prolactin. Pro means before. Lactin refers to milk, so this is going to stimulate milk production in the mammary glands. MSH uh, is going to stimulate the melanocytes, which you don't have to know about. Endorphins are uh, chemicals that reduce pain in the brain, and that's released by the anterior pituitary. And then there's growth hormones that affect the liver and bones that are involved with uh, growing and development of a uh, child. This ends part one on your notes on chapter 45, the endocrine system.